imagine you are Pac-Man. One day, you go for a walk. You grab your two-dimensional wallet, leave your two-dimensional house, and head off in some direction. After a bit of walking, you find a wallet. It's yours. Sure enough, your pockets are empty, you put your wallet away, and you continue. See, Pac-Man is accustomed to finding things he's dropped without ever turning around. Because when Pac-Man goes up through the top of his screen, he comes in through the bottom. When he goes out through the right, he comes in through the left. So what is this strange two-dimensional surface the Pac-Man lives on? Well, to Pac-Man, the top and bottom of the screen are the same. So we may as well glue them together. Now we have a cylinder. The right and left of the cylinder are also the same to Pac-Man's point of view, so let's glue them together. As we can see here, Pac-Man lives on the surface of a donut. Delicious. Why a donut? Why not some other two-dimensional surface? Pac-Man could very well be on a sphere. The gameplay would be a little bit different, but he could be on a sphere looking for cherries and hiding from ghosts. Or he could be on a two-hole donut. Same thing. Two -hole, surface of a two-hole donut is two-dimensional. Pac-Man's two-dimensional. This could totally work. Or maybe the screen is set up so that if Pac-Man goes up through the top, he comes in through the bottom as usual. But if he goes out through the right at the top, he comes in from the left at the bottom upside down. So what's going on here is that the right and left are connected, but in such a way that there's a twist when you glue them together. If you go through the same process we did before, if you've seen such an object before, Pac-Man here would live on the surface of a Klein bottle. I've given you a bunch of examples of, well, of worlds that Pac-Man could live on. This begs the question, what possible surfaces are there for him to live on? In order for us to make sense of this question, we first have to set down some ground rules. I'm going to consider two surfaces to be the same if I can stretch and squish one into the other. For example, a sphere is the same as that thing because I can just sort of warp it around. It's also the same of a, as a cube. I can just take my sphere and squish the sides in and make it into a cube. Another example is that a coffee cup, I'm talking about the outside surface of a coffee cup, is the same as a donut because I can take my coffee cup, put my hand through the handle, and pull out the inside. And then I've got sort of a handle with a blob and then squish that blob around the handle and now the hole through the donut is what used to be the hole through the handle of the coffee cup. So in this world, a coffee cup and a donut are going to be considered to be the same. With this point of view, this becomes a question in a branch of pure mathematics called topology. <coughs> the question of which two-dimensional surfaces can exist was answered about 100 years ago. It's a beautiful theorem, and we now have a complete list of all the possible surfaces. What about a three-dimensional Pac-Man? This is someone much like me. Likes cherries, hates ghosts, but most importantly, lives in a three-dimensional world. But maybe the world I live in is such that if I walk out that wall, I'd come in through there. Or if I look out the back, I'd see my own head. Or if I look up, I'm just thankful I'm not wearing a kilt. <laughs> or maybe that wall is glued to this wall with a twist in it. So if I look out the back there, I see myself standing on the wall. And if I look past myself, I see myself again standing on the ceiling. Or maybe that wall is glued to that wall with a flip. So if I raise my right hand and look out that wall, I'd see myself with my left hand raised. And then if I look past myself, I'd see myself with my right hand raised. Or maybe I'm not in a cube at all. Maybe I'm in a dodecahedron or a tetrahedron or some other three-dimensional object. And the faces are glued together in some curious way. After you work in this, uh, on this problem for a, a small amount of time, it becomes pretty clear that the three-dimensional <coughs> question of which three-dimensional surfaces can exist is far more complicated than the two-dimensional one. In fact, we didn't have a solution or a classification of which three-dimensional surfaces can exist until 2003. And this problem was answered, this question was answered by Russian mathematician Grigory Perelman. It's an important and difficult enough problem that it's worth a million bucks and the Fields Medal. <coughs> Interestingly, Perelman declined both. Two dimensions, three dimensions, we're mathematicians. What about a four-dimensional Pac-Man? 
Okay, let's just talk about what we mean by four dimensions first. In order to understand what I mean by a four-dimensional surface or a four-dimensional world that Pac-Man can live on, let's look at the two-dimensional surface again. This donut, what makes it two-dimensional? Right, where does the two come from? The important point here is that around any point on the donut, if I look at a little neighborhood of it, every point in that neighborhood is determined by two numbers, two coordinates, how far up and how far to the left. Right? Every point in that little neighborhood. And this happens everywhere on the surface. The three-dimensional uh, example I gave you of the cube where I walk out there and come in through here. Let's look at a little neighborhood around this point. It's like a little sphere. Every point in that little sphere is determined by three numbers. How far up, how far that way, and how far this way. There are three coordinates. The three is what makes this a three-dimensional surface. So a four-dimensional surface is just some space where around each point, if you look at a neighborhood, it looks like four-dimensional space. That is, every point is determined by four numbers, four coordinates. Mere mortals like us have a really hard time thinking about what this looks like. But mathematics doesn't care that we grew up in a three-dimensional world and our brains are feeble and can't do this. The mathematics can deal with this, no problem. It's just a fourth number, right? It's a fourth coordinate. So, which four-dimensional surfaces can exist for a four-dimensional Pac-Man to live on? We don't know. This is one of the most important open problems in topology today. It's the question that motivates some of the stuff that I work on. So let me tell you a little bit about that. One way to build four-dimensional surfaces is to take two two-dimensional surfaces and smush them together in such a way that the coordinate system, so those four numbers that determine my four-dimensional surface, the first two of them belong to one of my two-dimensional surfaces, and the second two of them belong to another one. The take-home message here is that because 2 plus 2 equals 4, I can take two two-dimensional surfaces, stitch them together in such a way, and get a four-dimensional surface out. Okay, this is the key point here. If you want to understand these four-dimensional surfaces, it turns out that you can gain some understanding about them by looking at symmetries of the underlying two-dimensional surfaces, right? these building blocks that made this four-dimensional surface. So what's a symmetry? Symmetry is something you hear a lot about in mathematics. And What's a symmetry? So a symmetry is something I can do to an object while you're looking away, having a nap, not paying attention, that you can't tell I did when you wake up again. For example, if I had a glass of wine here, and I turned it, and you were looking away while I did that, you wouldn't be able to tell that I did that. That's a symmetry of the glass of wine. If I drank some, you could tell, because the level would have gone down. I don't study glasses of wine, unfortunately, um, but I do study symmetries of two-dimensional surfaces. So here's an example of a symmetry. If I take a two-hole donut, I could flip it. If you were looking away while I did that, you couldn't tell it happened. Here's an example of a three-hole donut. Uh, an example uh, of a symmetry, sorry, of a three-hole donut. If I rotate by 120 degrees, again, if you were looking away, you wouldn't be able to tell that I did that. If you take a surface, a two-dimensional surface, and look at the entire group of symmetries, so there's a whole bunch of symmetries for any one surface, that entire group of symmetries <coughs> has structure on it in the same way that the whole numbers have addition. You can take two whole numbers and get another one out, you can take two symmetries and get another symmetry out. If you can understand this structure, it turns out that you can use that understanding to understand the four-dimensional surface that you built. So that's the, that's the area I work in, is the symmetries of two-dimensional surfaces. But at this point, I want to address, just to finish off, I want to address a question that a lot of you might have right now, which is a perfectly reasonable question. Who cares? I get this a lot. It's much more polite usually, but this is what people are thinking when I talk to them about what I do. Right? Who cares? Why should you care about something abstract like pure mathematics or topology? I'm going to give you two reasons. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, I want you to take these two reasons away. First, topology is part of the gigantic machine that starts at pure mathematics and ends at new technology and understanding. 
uh, the universe really does seem to be written in the language of mathematics. Philosopher Eugene Wigner calls this the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Time and time again, seemingly abstract, nonsense pieces of mathematics have found applications, important ones, well after they were discovered. For example, complex numbers were initially discovered simply to solve equations that couldn't be solved using real numbers. Now they form the framework in which to understand electricity. This is the natural framework in which to understand electricity. Minkowski's geometry for curved space was discovered well before Einstein used it to formulate his general theory of relativity, without which today we wouldn't have GPS. There have been cases where fundamental particles of the universe have been predicted to exist with certain properties simply because an abstract mathematical object exists. The topological foundations laid down 100 years ago are being used today in quantum computing and even featured in last year's Nobel Prize in chemistry. Pure mathematics is useful and indispensable to society. That's the first reason. It's a pretty good reason, I reckon. Here's the second reason. Pure mathematics is beautiful and awesome and amazing. Like music and art, it has this incredible aesthetic quality. Pure mathematics, and especially topology, is one of the most beautiful and compelling things anyone can experience. This is more than enough of a reason for me to do what I do. Thank you.